Good evening, welcome to Central News for Thursday the 19th of December. I'm Hilary Entwistle. Police dogs are sniffing out those in need of crime prevention advice as part of a new initiative in the Bay of Plenty. For some time the police have used cocooning in a number of areas as a strategy to help protect people from burglary and other dishonesty offending. This currently entails a leaflet drop and some visits to homes within 100 metres radius of a burglary in order to raise awareness, provide prevention advice and encourage vigilance. The Bay of Plenty Dog section has decided it can enhance this service using man's best friend to track down homes and businesses that may benefit from crime prevention information. Each time a police dog tracks from a burglary, a leaflet will be provided to all properties along the route the offender took. In addition, the dog handler will identify high-risk properties along the track and an officer will then pay a personal visit to those premises to offer advice and support which may prevent them from becoming a future victim of crime. With the festive season in full swing, Bay Plenty residents continue to shop until they drop, with annual spending increasing 6.9% for the first two weeks of December. Paymark figures released this week reveal Bay shoppers spent $140.3 million the 14 days between December 1st and 14, up on last year's $131.2 million. The trend continues nationwide, with Kiwis getting stuck into their Christmas shopping, 7.7% on last December, to sit above the 5.7% average increase seen during the first 11 months of this year. Paymark, which processes about three quarters of all electronic transactions in New Zealand, saw more than $2.6 billion pass through its network in the 14 days between December 1st and 14th. Now for our region's weather, Friday for you Hamilton will be fine with southwesterly breezes. Your expected high is 23 and an overnight low of 10. Tauranga, you will have a fine Friday with light winds and an expected high of 24 and an overnight low of 13. Just ahead, the latest fallout. Welcome to Central News on TV Central. Tonight, Central News is celebrating the success of some of our smaller centres. First off is the latest fallout. The band members are originally from all over the Waikato, who have recently released their second music video and are busy working on the upcoming release of their debut album. Welcome to the program. Now, it has been almost a year since you were signed with um, Southern Cross Collective record label. Yeah. So what has run, you know, what has been happening since then? Um, it's this year especially has been just, yeah, crazy. It's been an amazing year. Um, we've, at the end of last year, crossing into this year, we had a four festival sort of tour kind of thing that we kind of planned in. It wasn't like a, a national tour for us or anything, but we sort of crossed it in with um, a whole lot of festivals that we were playing at. Um, the first one was uh, Samstock in Dunedin which was quite a long way away and we all tripped down in the car for that one. So that was mental, that was awesome. Um, and then the next one was uh, Carnival in Hawke's Bay, which was crossing back up and that was on my birthday as well. And um, the one after that was, um, we played a Parachute, which was the first time for us and that was just incredible, we loved that. Was we had over a hundred people turn up just for us, so you know, that was, that was huge for us. And then the last one was um, we played with Avalanche City, and that was just, yeah, that was awesome. They are so quite cool. a big band mm, nationally. 3,000 people, so it was awesome. <laughs> Do you get nervous playing to a bigger crowd? or Not really, which is, yeah, for me, definitely bigger crowds don't phase me at all. You know, I take, I take the opportunity in and just so awesome to play to that many people, but I don't get nervous. If there's like three people or five people, I get really nervous. So the more people, the better. It just you can't focus on what they're thinking, and their body language doesn't give off strongly enough. But if you're, you know, playing to five people and they're like, then it's very <laughs> intimidating, and you don't get into it much at all. But when there's so many people, you just there's no way you're going to read even one person's mind. So you just you just do what you do, and you just don't even think about it. So mm. it's, yeah, bigger crowds are way better. Because you've said that you actually strive to be better live yes. than on record. Yeah. Why? 
definitely. It's just with recording, we've found there's so much that you can do to a recording. So it's it's just personally with <clears throat> my journey of being a singer and a musician, I just like anything in life want to be the best I can, and you know that means at any any length. You know, um, like with the album, I'll if I get anything wrong, I'll sing it again, even if it takes me forever. It has to be right because I just I can't settle for second best and just be like, oh, we'll just fix that later. You know, because then it shows off how good you are live because. When you're recording a song, especially, you know your weaknesses and what you need to practice. And so when you're recording a song, you'll go, oh, that was amazing. But then when you see the band live, you'll be like, oh, yeah, they must have pitch corrected that bit in the studio because they can't do that live. And it's consistent that they can't do it. So you know that that wasn't, they can't actually do it. And I've spent way too many years having YouTube comas just. <laughs> you know, watching YouTube for hours on end, trying to find the most natural talent that people just sit there, it's live and it's just perfection from start to finish and it's so organic, that is what I just, I could almost say that I'm obsessed with that, that I just scale YouTube trying to find people that are just so good live that, you know, they could just sit down, you know, like this with you and they could just bout out anything or just do anything. And sometimes they're playing guitar as well, and it's incredible. And it's just, there's nothing to enhance it. It is naturally just that perfect. And that's what I strive for. Do you think the industry is changing as well? Because I've noticed there's a lot of um, bigger names coming to yeah. New Zealand. Because yeah. you can't make money off records so yeah. much anymore because it's all you know downloading free. So is there more of this need to be better live yes. because you make your money out of touring? I, I reckon it is because you know these bands, you know, it, and these artists, like it seems, you know, it seems really bad that they never came before now. You know, now that they need it, they come. You know, which, you know, but I can understand it's so far away, and you know, there's a lot of people in the teams to be involved and stuff. But yeah, the music industry I've found out lately is suffering so much, and it's, it's really scary. Like my dream and what I want to do in life is music, but when you see the top of the scale, you get kind of scared because you're wanting to be in an industry that's failing and is going through so many problems at the moment, you know, especially New Zealand music. It's very hard to get out there, like bands like us, you know, when I was younger, like 48 May, Goodnight Nurse, um, all those bands, they were incredible. And it seems like we're in the next span of those bands coming out, but it's just, mm. we're not getting where we need to be getting. And I feel like it's it's just the music industry suffering that they, they're really choosy with who they're trying to sign and stuff so um, yeah people that are going to big lengths to tour they have to up their game with their live performance because it's not just to be a really good singer it's everything you know the stage set you know how you perform the whole band choreography and everything and yeah it's just you have to let out your best talent every time at a show or else you just walk away going oh well that wasn't really worth my money you know and you want people to be buying your music as much as possible so you can make a living off it so so when can we buy the album then um, yeah, we do have a release date and it is for January next year, so it's very soon, so there's a lot of work to be done, um, mixing the album and getting it finally finished, but we've, we're so almost there, it's so awesome, yeah. It's, it's been a year, just over a year now, since we started recording on this, um, after our EP was released, um, but yeah, we can say that it's going to be out in January and we're going to start selling it and stuff. You'll so, be able to finally hold something tangible. Yeah, it, it's going to be terrifying, but yeah, I just can't wait for people to have it and just see what we've been through and, you know, what new songs they can have because it's, you know, we've played a few of them live, but we've sort of tried to tone back on some of them so that people forget that they've heard them and then they hear them completely fresh on the new album. And there's a lot of songs that people haven't heard at all anywhere. Like, there's at least five that people haven't heard at all. So. It all sounds very exciting. Well, good luck with the release of it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Coming up next, we see what Thames has to offer. Welcome back. Another successful local of the regions is a woman from Thames who has self-published her own novel based around her hometown of Thames. Jan hopes with all the good mining history she has explored throughout the novel, it could bring more people to the town. Welcome Jan, so tell us about your new book, Gold Wine Experience. 
Um, it's a story that I hope will appeal to a whole lot of people. It's set partly in Thames. The idea of writing it is to bring people to the Thames, uh, to Thames and the Coromandel. And um, yeah, I'd love to see more visitors come there. Some of the action takes place in an old gold mine um, because the gold discovery in the 1860s is what brought people to Thames. Um, so it is the history of Thames, but there are lots of overseas um, trips in it as well. There's a trip to Numea, a trip to Brisbane, and there's South Island is also described. So it is a New Zealand novel. I mean, to write a book with a lot of history in it, you've probably got to do a lot of uh, research into the history. So did you learn quite a bit about the history of Thames? Oh yes, although I had picked that up incidentally, but yes I did have to read up about the history of Thames. And then I also did a lot of other research. Um, I don't want to give away the plot, but I had to research the history of the Nazi party in Germany. And then I did a lot of research into the history of South Africa as well. So that was really good because I learned a lot. Oh, that sounds interesting. Because it is a thriller, isn't it? Yes, yes. I wrote it as a murder mystery, but it's being marketed as a thriller. Mm -hmm. Now, what did you learn about the history of Thames? I mean, why should we go to Thames? Because it's fun, it's interesting. A lot of the houses are really beautiful. They're the old villa style houses made of wood. Um, if you, oh, you'll see ornate carved woodwork on the roofs and on the wooden verandas. I mean, people still sit out there and watch the world go by. And for people who come from a city, that is beautiful. And then there are also places where, you know how people used to have an outdoor toilet? And so people have sort of added on a passageway and then you've got little cottages and, and it's, it's all quite, quite strange, the architecture, but you can see this is a mining, miner's cottage and it has been converted. And some people bought two miner's cottages and then put them together. But, but as well as that, you have the big, lovely old villas too. So, yeah, that's oh, fun. Wow. And what is, is the mine? Can we still go and visit the mine in Thames? Oh, the underground tunnels are still there, and that is so exciting. It's so much fun going through there. In the summer, it's open for tourists, um, but not in the winter. And then there are historical relics of the old machinery and so on. So it's not a working gold mine, but it is like an outdoor museum. It's, it's, it's interesting. A lot of overseas tourists come and visit. It's fun. And you hope that the book will try and bring more people to the area? I hope so, yes, because a lot of people at the moment just drive straight through Thames on the way to Coromandel, on the way to Hotwater Beach. But we do have beautiful cafes and very friendly people. Now you say that your novel is distinctly Kiwi. So how, how do you describe a distinctly Kiwi novel? Well, I've tried to represent Kiwi culture as it is, and I've had comments from expats who've read it and said they love it, but it makes them feel homesick, in fact. So, and I really like that because that was my aim. I don't know what you read at school, but, but when I was at school, we had to read Shakespeare and then Jane Austen, Charles Dickens. We didn't read any New Zealand literature. And I think we have a lot of writers in this country and we do have a unique culture and it is time to start portraying it. Speaking of being an author in New Zealand, how did you find the publishing process? Because you know a lot of people say nowadays that it is quite hard to get published and be an established author in New Zealand. How was that process for you? It is really difficult unless you write the luminaries and luck out, it is really difficult. 90% um, of publishers lose money on a first-time author, first-time fiction author, and that explains why so many publishing houses are closing and why authors get so many rejection letters. <laughs> so, I mean, it's good to try all the known sources, all known publishers, it's good to write to them. And some people do that and then wait years and years before they get published, but I, only waited about a year because, well, because I've got the idea of my next novel in my head and because I just wanted to 
get on with it. And so I went with self self publishing in the end. And do I mean, uh, how hard is it to self publish? Oh, it's not. Well, it depends. I'm sure it depends. I'm sure there are a lot of road companies out there who just want to take your money and run. I mean, that applies to everything. But I went with Archway because Archway Publishing because they're backed by Simon and Schuster in New York, and that is huge. I kn I knew I know they must have their legal contracts sorted, so I w I felt comfortable going with them, and they have been very professional. I've I've been very happy with it. And it certainly must be, yeah, it sounds like, it, it sounds like from what I've heard is it is getting harder. So do you have a full-time job and this is just your hobby? Oh yes, I work as a teacher. I, I would not recommend anyone to be just an author. It's too hard financially. So yeah, keep your day job, definitely. Um, but, but I love it. It's, it's a great thing to do and I just love writing. But, but yes, definitely, it's important to have a day job. So whereabouts can we get Goldmine Experience? Um, it's available at Paper Power in Thames and also on Amazon.com and all the other online retailers. Just ahead, we meet the international sensation, the lads. If you have just joined us, welcome to Central News. The lads, originally from little old New Zealand, are a Christian rock band who had such a following here, they decided to move to Nashville, Tennessee and try their luck in the States. And it worked. They now have their very own TV show. I caught up with them in studio. Well, welcome to the show to both of you. Now, why did you guys actually want to come all the way back to New Zealand for a couple of shows? Hobbits. Mm, we heard that if we came to Matter Matter, we would see some actual real life hobbits. That's what they told us. Well, yeah, it's true. I haven't seen you, any yet. You know, the, the reality is, I mean, who wouldn't want to come back, right? You know, stuck over there in the US and, and uh, missing home like crazy. Someone invites us to Matter Matter, like, yes, please. You know, the, the US is a, it's a, a vast country. It's a very big country and there's some amazing parts of it, but New Zealand is incredible. So. Any chance we can get, then um, we'll definitely take it. And it's it's been awesome, it's been wonderful being back. It's true. We, we actually stayed on a farm last night, just down the road, and I didn't want to leave. <laughs> so the greenery is too nice here, eh? It's mm. amazing. Yeah. Next time we come, we might even talk to the farmer beforehand to tell them we're coming so we can actually go inside. Actually, right. just yeah. being outside on the farm, it's yeah. a little bit cold. Still worth it, yeah. Still it was worth, worth it. it. It was worth it. And, and maybe you, you could organise. a cow and mm. fine. I had to knit a jumper off a sheep, but it was fine. Yeah. And you didn't organise any hobbits for you? Not yet. Well, that, we're hoping to find someone. Mm. We're going hunting soon. Mm. So. Apparently. No, apparently. Do you know you, where we should go? If you shoot them in the leg, apparently it only hurts for a little while. It, like, it doesn't hurt them. They don't have the same feelings as us, like fish. And, yeah, right. and then you can see them up close. Right. Right, moving on. Um, how was the show last night? How, did, how was the audience? Do you want us to give a real answer or just make stuff up again like we have been doing so? <laughs> <laughs> It was great. You know, it was a real bummer that it rained so hard to start with. Yeah. No one was really expecting that it kind of just dropped, man. And just I was impressed so many people bought umbrellas. Yeah. I never take an umbrella out. So we played we played a, a few songs to start off the night, and uh, it was kind of weird because we couldn't tell if the crowd was enjoying it because all we saw were umbrellas. But uh, it, it all cleared up, and then and the crowd stuck around, and, and it was great, man. It was really fun. I was amazed by how much incredible local talent there is. Yeah. Some of the dance groups, some of the, the teenagers singing, mm -hmm. the different groups. It was actually amazing from just around, just matter matter and a few, I, not too far further than that. Yeah, there's some cool. amazing talent. So it was, it was incredible for us to see. Mm -hmm. Now you guys are doing very well internationally. You have started here in New Zealand. So can you tell us a little bit more about the history of the band and the success? Ah, well, we we kind of actually grew up as friends, and there there, there was we, we've had lots of different band members come and go, and and uh, it was really just a bunch of mates hanging out, and uh, we learned. We, in fact, we didn't even know instruments when we started. We did this a cappella rap crossover, which was obviously that wasn't going to work. Nah, it didn't work at all, but it was worth a try. But uh, yeah, so it just kind of grew up, and and then as we kind of went through high school, it was just a just a fun thing to do, and but we had people and churches asking us to come and do stuff and we're like really all right because you know it's kind of fun to be on stage and show off as when you're a young teenager but then uh through uni it just became a bit more of a focus and then at the end of uni we just uh we all went and got part-time jobs so we could do the band part-time and 
just, just grew from there. Grew from there, yeah. Yeah, and we, we travelled around the uh, around New Zealand, Australia, playing in high schools, and we played thousands of high schools over a period of a few years, and and uh, we had a good crack at Australia, but they're a hard bunch, you know. So mm. we tried, we tried. No, it went really well. We did about thirty tours of Australia, and and then we just got to a point where we felt like, man, we we really feel like we need to keep going with this, but. You know, there's only so many times a New Zealander can come out and see you play before they're going, yeah, you guys are great, but them again. I saw you last week, you know, so so we felt like we needed to broaden, you know, just spread our wings. And, and we thought about Australia, but they just kept making fun of us and saying yeah, sheep jokes. Yeah. We're like, we can't do that. Yeah, it can we only can't. take so much before you kind of hard exterior wears down. Whereas again. in the United States, they don't even know there's a lot of sheep in New Zealand to make jokes. No. You guys have been so successful in national that you've actually got your own TV show. So tell us about that. Yeah, that was a funny thing. We, I think, deep down, um, you know, false humility aside, we actually think we're quite funny. So um, it's true. It's true. So <laughs> we laugh at our own jokes, even when no one else does, which is. So um, we do a lot of work as a band with with families. So a lot of our events are with families and kids spend so much time in front of the television. We thought, you know, why don't instead of just doing music. What if we could actually um, communicate and leave our ladsness behind um, on a TV thing? So, so we kind of had this crazy idea, but we had no way of doing it. We didn't know a thing about TV stuff, and and we kind I've of watched it though. I've watched TV. <laughs> so, so we rang up and found and said, well, we want to make a TV show. We we kind of rang out some studios and said, how much to hire your studio in Nashville? And they're phenomenally expensive. And I think when you go overseas, you realise a lot about your New Zealandness and what it means to be a New Zealander. And New Zealanders are at the core very resourceful. So we thought, okay, studio won't work. But we found an old supermarket that was about to be bowled down so they could build another building. And, and we said to the guy, who, who the owner, and said, you reckon we could use your supermarket? He goes, sure. And for Nick's, like, for almost nothing. So we had this, like, we found someone else who could build sets. And a friend of ours was a camera guy. And we met someone the week before who was a um, lighting guy. And we didn't know a sound guy. So we had to kind of do a whole episode twice because we messed that up. But yeah. but you realise that using a little bit of resourcefulness, and we're Christians as well, so there's a God factor as well. We can do extraordinary, extraordinary things. So we did this little series just to sell at our shows, and then a a network in the states, it's one of the the Christian networks, said to us, "Hey, should we do something together?" So then we went to their real studio um, in the the part of Nashville that um, Johnny Cash comes from, and uh, we went there, did did ten episodes in a real studio, and that's broadcast right now in 180 countries around the world, which is which is crazy. Just that's a couple crazy. of guys from New Zealand that had a go. That's amazing. That's definitely an inspiring story. And thank you very much for coming in and all the best for the rest of your whirlwind tour. Thanks so much. That is Central News for tonight. Email us at news at tvcentral.co.nz or like us on Facebook and let us know if you have your own stories. Join me tomorrow night for the last show of the year. I'm Hilary Entwistle. Have a lovely evening. This has been an Alpha Media production, a division of Television Media Group. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.